Well, welcome New Hope Central Oahu Ohana Mililani Campus. Uh, Gail and I are here to welcome you to our services this weekend. And this week is a special week for Gail and I because we are celebrating our... 30th. 30th birthday, no, 30th wedding anniversary. And we're here at this nice restaurant uh, venue and we wanna welcome you to our services this weekend. And uh, we pray that you will be safe and secure under the protection of Jesus. And let's now worship him as our protector, as a provider, as the one who will carry us through this pandemic. And let's worship the Lord together as a family. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we'll welcome you to our services this weekend. We are so grateful that we can turn to you in these uncertain times, that we know that in all these uncertainties we face, we know one thing for sure, that you are our rock, you are our fortress, and you are our stronghold. And we choose now to put our trust in you and worship you now in spirit and in truth. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And here, here we, we go. go.
everyone, let's just welcome the presence of Jesus with us right now. Heavenly Father, we just recognize and acknowledge your presence with us right now. We worship you in spirit and truth, and when we do, we don't have to be looking for you because you're looking for us. You are seeking such worshipers. And so right now, with all of our heart and with all of our mind and soul and strength, we worship you. And we just welcome your presence into every household, every person that's watching right now. May they encounter your presence right now in this service in a real way, in a life-changing way, in a life-transforming way as we deal with the reckoning. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's children said, amen. 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 Remember when you were a little kid and someone asked what you wanted to be when you grew up? They expected one answer, maybe two. As we grow, most people spend their time getting good at a few things on their way to build a good life. The problem is we were made for much, much more. But expectations, limitations, and labels can slowly hem you in and confine you, quieting the wonder, zest, and imagination you used to have. You find yourself reaching for that endless stream of entertainment that continues to pull your head down when you should be reaching up and out. But what if there is more? We know what it's like to be confined to just a few tiny facets of who you are. We humans are so complex, so rich and diverse, we should never be contained by titles, roles, or labels. And just like you, we've spent our time getting good at a few things, but we're artists, doctors, teachers, homemakers, pastors, actors, and more, who have taught and learned beside hundreds of people just like you, who never imagined all the incredible creativity that lay within them, waiting to be nurtured and released. What if you could rediscover the awe of childhood? You were created to create. Whether in the arts world or not, you are called to be creative in your workplace, schools, and in your hobbies and homes, and bring transformation. Be creative as a lifestyle. Register today for the What If Creativity Conference, and our speakers will walk you through an amazing journey to discover how to unleash untapped wells of creative juice inside of you, just waiting to spring into the world. We won't compare, but encourage. We will unveil how your design is unique and dynamic. Reawaken the childlike spirit within you. And you won't just be a spectator either. Our workshops are designed to be hands-on and you'll have time to actually begin creating at the conference. Imagine, what if you could move from distracted and bored and entertained into a life full of excitement, curiosity, fun, and wonder? Open the door to explosive joy as you discover the unique treasure that has been designed in you by your creator. What if isn't the question, what if is the answer. Aloha, what an amazing time of worship that was. Well, my name is Pastor Rich, and it's my privilege to be able to welcome you today to New Hope Central Oahu Online. We're so glad you're here today, each and every one of you. And if you're here for the very first time, we're especially excited that you're here today. One of the things that we want to invite you to do is to fill out an online connection card. It's a way that we find out more information about you and your family, and you can find out more information about us and the different ministries at the church. It's also an opportunity for all of us to fill out a prayer request or a praise report, to be able to tell each other and stay in communication about what our needs are and what God's been doing in our lives. Now, as you're filling that out, I have a couple of announcements to share with you. The first one is that Foodland will once again be running their Give Aloha campaign. It's been a fantastic gift matching uh, program that they run in September. And to tell you a little bit more about that campaign, here's a video, check it out. September is the month to give aloha, a time when we come together to help Hawaii's nonprofits. And because of the Foodland match, every dollar you give gives more. Foodland, food, family, friends, and aloha. Well, New Hope Central Oahu is once again privileged to be associated and partnered with Foodland in this campaign. And so on the screen right now is the number that you'll need in September when you go to Foodland and you make your donation right there at the register, and you'll need to be a Maikai card member as well. And so take note of this number. And uh, when that time comes, you'll be able to give through that campaign, and it just kind of amplifies your gift a little bit more. Now, the next thing I want to share with you is that the Aloha Teams is going to be doing a food distribution again 
August 21st at the Hope Center in Wahiwa. That's at 935 Kilani Avenue, and it's going to be from 10 to 12 o'clock. And one of the things that they need are donations. They need non-perishable food items. Uh, you know, if you've got toilet paper that you know you've stockpiled, and now maybe you don't need so much, you can share that with those who are really going through a tough time through this COVID-19 crisis. Or maybe you have canned goods or bags of rice or, or, or things like that that you might be able to donate. So if you do have something like that, then we recommend that you contact Kimmy Soroka, and the number's there on the screen, and she'll be able to help you coordinate the pickup or drop off of those items. Also, you may be interested in volunteering at that time to be part of those that are just you know, sign waving or helping pass out food or uh, just all the different things that go into those food distributions. And so if you'd like to donate your time for that, then contact her as well. All right, well, this is the portion of our service where we continue in worship through giving. Now, if you are here for the very first time, please feel no obligation to give. Consider this service as our gift to you. But if you do consider New Hope Central Wahoo as your home church, then we just ask you to give as the Lord leads. And there's four ways that you can do that. You can use the give buttons right here on this page. You can go to our main website, nhtohawaii.org, and there's a give button in the upper right-hand corner of the page. You can use our mobile app, which is a really easy and convenient way to do it. Or if you haven't downloaded our app yet, you can just simply text NHCO to the number 77977 and follow the prompts. All right, let's pray for the offering. Father, Lord, it's neat to see all the different ways that you're moving in our community, God. And Lord, we know that as we engage with you, as, as we uh, draw close to you, Lord, that just makes you able to work through us more and more. So Father Lord, we just ask that, we, that as we give these gifts, Lord, that we be able to do that from, get, from hearts that are uh, trusting in you, Lord, that are cheerful, uh, Lord, that are willing, and Lord, that are excited to see what you're gonna do with these gifts. Lord, use it to build your kingdom, both with our neighbors and in our own hearts, God. And Father, we're excited to see what you're gonna do. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to give. Lord, bless your holy name, God. We are so privileged to be able to be called your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, without any further ado, let's watch this next installment in our Breaking Point series. Good morning, everybody. Pastor Teresa here, and I just want to welcome all of you to our online services for New Hope Central Oahu. We are so excited that you joined us today. And if you're joining us for the first time, we are concluding our series, Breaking Point, Faith Under Pressure. In week one, Pastor Glenn opened us up with an amazing introductory to the book of James, where he first and foremost defined what a breaking point was. And so Pastor Glenn said, a breaking point is the moment of greatest pressure of which someone or something gives way. And we looked at, but what do we give way to? What is our faith giving way to? And we talked about trials and desires, passion, our words, and all the various things of the world. And then in week two, Pastor Lori gave us an incredible message talking about the trials and the temptations that we face. And so one of the key things that I really was excited to learn about through the book of James, is that we are surprised by where those trials and temptations really come from. You see, many of us give the enemy too much credit for the trials and the temptations that we face day to day. And in reality, we learn that our desires are where our trials and temptations come from. Those are the things that are most inward in our hearts. And so we can't outwardly focus and blame the things of this world. We can't even blame the enemy. We really need to take a hard look on what's going on on the inside of our hearts and examine the desires of our hearts and really look to see, are these desires of God or are these desires of my flesh? The week after that, in week three, I was so proud as a mom. My son, Micah, gave an awesome message about surrendering and tossing up the white flag. You see, we are indeed in a battle and it's a battle every single day against our faith. And when we, list, when we think about um, battles, we think of nobody would want to raise a white flag because that indicates that we are defeated. But what we learned in week three, that in reality, the greatest victory in the battle that we face day to day comes from raising that white flag of surrender and surrendering our whole being to the Lord and surrendering in a way that allows us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Two weeks ago, 
we had Pastor Mark, who did a phenomenal message again, and he talked about one of the greatest pressure points that we probably all face, every single one of us, I know this was a huge one for me in my faith walk, is the power of our words. That our words can either build up or they're gonna tear you down. This past week, we had an awesome panel discussion about our passions versus our convictions and how every single one of us has passions and passions most represent our emotions, but what we want to do is live our lives based off of our convictions convictions and the convictions that we actually get from the Word of God and from the Holy Spirit convicting us from the inside out. And so that brings us to today's message, the reckoning. And so all of this working together is showing us how there are so many things of this world and moments in time where our faith can break under the pressures of day-to-day -day living. And so what do we do with that? How do we make sure that we're living our faith out and we're living in a way that is pleasing to the Lord? So this morning, like Pastor Glenn, I'd like to first open up and define what is the reckoning. And if you look in the dictionary, it basically says that reckoning is the action or process of calculating or estimating something. It's a person's view, opinion, or judgment. And so when I first listened to that definition, I was like, wow, that's a lot that goes on in the reckoning. And oftentimes many of us reflect, and if, if maybe you're not that type of person, I know I am, I always am reminded that there will be a judgment day, that we are going to be judged by the Lord on how we live this one life that he's given us here on earth for his glory. And more than that, the reckoning this morning that I wanna say is something that goes on on the inside of you that is a determining factor, a decision that one needs to make on what their viewpoint is going to be, what their opinion is going to be, and what is truly going to be the conviction they will live out here on this earth. The reckoning is that drawing a line in the sand and having a resolve on the convictions and the way that you're going to live and choosing to live a life of righteousness according to God's word. It is a decision that every believer needs to make that I will align my life with the ways of the Lord, not the ways of the world. And so how do we get to that point? Well, I'm gonna talk about that in, in just a minute, but more importantly, we're gonna talk about why is it so significant that every believer understands that they need to come to that moment in time where they're face to face with their savior and the Holy Spirit is convicting them on how they're going to choose to live their everyday life. And so as we continue to dig into the book of James, James finishes out this amazing epistle to all of us Christians that are scattered all over the world. And he ends it and he concludes it with a final exhortation. And so I'm gonna read a very significant part of that. And it comes from James chapter five. And I'm going to be starting at verse 13. James says, are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. So let me stop right there. And what I love about this scripture is how he opened it up. He basically is saying, are you struggling right now? Are you having issues? Then you should pray. But on the flip side, are you happy? Are you filled with joy? Are you having success? Are you living your best life? You should still come into the presence of the Lord in prayer through praise. And I love that. I love, love, love that. Because as I started my Christian walk, one of the first things I learned is that no matter what's going on in your life, good or bad or ugly, you always want to praise God. Even when the Israelites were facing war, the first thing they did, and you can look this up in the book of Chronicles, the first thing they did was they sent out the worshipers to go ahead of them to praise God. Why? Because victory is in our praise. As we praise God and we acknowledge him and we thank him and we give him gratitude for who he is, it activates supernatural power on our behalf here on earth. And so no matter what it is you're going through, just remember that come into God's presence in prayer and first and foremost, start with praise. And it doesn't matter if it's for sad things or for happy things, come into God's presence in prayer and pray. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about prayer. But first, let me finish reading at verse 16. After he says this great exhortation about prayer, 
He goes on in verse 16 to say, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. And he says in verse 17, Elijah was a human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. And so James is trying to show the people of God the power of our prayer when we pray in righteousness. Is it in our righteousness? No, it's in righteousness of Christ. We are made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And when we are in alignment with Jesus, we know how to be right with God. And so when we pray, there is a righteous prayer there. It is a prayer of faith that says, I believe even though I cannot see. It is a prayer of faith that says, yes, this person is sick, but I am praying by faith that this person can be made healed and whole. It is the prayer of the faithful righteous person that says, I am so full of life and so full of joy and so full of happiness and so full of gratitude that I will praise my God and give him all glory and honor that is due his name. It is so powerful when the people of God recognize how powerful even one person that is righteous before the Lord, what can happen if they choose to submit their life in prayer. And I know that there is degrees of prayer. I know that, you know, when my kids were little, we taught them simple prayers like God is kind, God is good, thank you Jesus for all our food. Something that was simple, even before they could even memorize that. We would tell them just to call on the name of the Lord. I would tell the children, even if you don't know what to say, just say the name Jesus. There's power in the name Jesus. Just say, Jesus, I need you Jesus. Even if you don't even know what you need, just cry out to the Lord. And I think the point that James is trying to make is that there are gonna be things in this world that come against us. And we are never gonna be able to stand in the midst of all that apart from Jesus. And so how does that reckoning happen? That reckoning on the inside that gives you the boldness and the conviction to live according to God's ways, his desires, his plans for you. It comes from communion and prayer with the one who created you through Jesus Christ. And so in conclusion, I wanna just share a quick acronym for prayer, okay? Cause I, my husband is the acronym king. And so I have a couple of acronyms I wanna share with you this morning. The first acronym is PRAY. And for PRAY, I came up with an acronym to help us to understand what is it that we're doing in order to pray, right? Sometimes we make prayer this big elaborate thing where you have all these fancy prayers that you have to memorize and say, I know that when I grew up in the Catholic church and I'm not dogging the Catholic church, I love my Catholic upbringing, but it was a lot of memorized rote prayer. And so I didn't quite understand prayer back then, but now that I'm growing in the Lord and my intimacy with God, and I recognize that my prayer life is more about a relationship with my best friend and the lover of my soul. It is a communion, a conversation that never ends. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. And so it is a constant dialogue between you and the Lord. Okay. But there is significance when we actually take time to pause and go into the presence of God. So the first acronym I wanna share with you for prayer is that, number one, you first need to pause. In the hustle and bustle of everyday life, think about how many times a day you actually can stop, pause, turn the world off, and put your mind solely on the Lord and drawing near to Him. So first P, you're gonna pause. Then R, you're gonna reflect. Reflect on what you're feeling. Reflect on what you're processing. Reflect on what's going on around you. Reflect on what it is that God might be trying to say to you. And A, become ever more aware. So A is awareness. Be aware of God's presence. Be aware of what he's trying to reveal to you. Be aware of what he's trying to show you. Be aware of how he's trying to connect with you. And the last is Y is yield. Yield and surrender to whatever that moment is going to look like between you and the Lord. That could be one minute, it could be five minutes, it could be an hour, it could be 15 hours. It really depends on what is the Father wanting to do with you in that moment. And the second acronym that I came up with to make this simple on prayer is using the actual word prayer. And so how do we do prayer? What is it that we're supposed to do after we've paused, reflected, we're aware of his presence and now we're yielded and we're surrendered to him what do we do now, Pastor Teresa? Okay, well, for prayer, this is what we're going to do. 
Number one, P, we're going to praise God. The Bible tells us that we should enter his courts with shouts of thanksgiving and praise. You want to come into God's presence with a heart of gratitude. Why? Because it puts us in a position of humility. We are humble before Almighty God, and we want to thank him and praise him. If every morning when I wake up, the first thing I want to say before I let my feet touch the ground is thank you, Father, for getting me up this morning. Lord, I love you that you are so dear to my heart and I know that I am dear to your heart. I just begin to talk to God early in the morning because I don't want to start my day without coming into his presence. And once you've had a moment of praise and thanksgiving and showing your gratitude for him, what do you do next? Well, R stands for repent. You're going to come into God's presence and you're going to say, okay, Lord, I, you know, I love you. Would you reveal to me any areas of sin in my life that I need to repent from? Because how many of us know that you can do a lot of dumb things in the day and not even realize that you've sinned against God. Which is why it's so important that prayer and repentance and asking forgiveness should be a part of our everyday lives. I don't know of a perfect person yet that I've met that hasn't fallen or stumbled or had a wrong thought or said the wrong thing or used the wrong tone or yelled at their child or, or you know, cussed at the guy that, you know, cut him off on the, on the freeway. I don't know a human being that has, is so perfect that they can go 24 hours and not maybe have done something against the Lord. You know, I know that I can't. I know that every day I have to ask God to forgive me for something. And so you want to praise him and then you want to come into a place of repentance. And it, the, the scripture tells us, search me, oh God, and know my ways so that you can repent and he'll show you and he doesn't do it in a berating way he does it in a gentle way he'll remind you of something that you said or something that you thought and then you quickly just say lord forgive me for that i did not mean to react that way i didn't mean to have that thought i didn't mean to do that and then after you've done praise and then after you've repented now you're ready to ask the next letter in the word prayer is a and that stands for ask you ask for what it is you need you ask for what you desire. You ask for somebody else's need. It's not just about praying and asking for yourself. It's about praying and asking for those around you as we pray for one another. Maybe you're praying for somebody's healing. That's where you're going to ask. You're going to ask God to bring his healing power into that person's life. But one other thing that I think every believer should be asking on a regular day is, Lord, I'm asking that you change and transform my heart so that my, de my desires are in alignment with your desires. Father, may my thoughts be your thoughts. May my words be your words. May my heart's longing be what is longing in your heart. And when you ask that kind of prayer of the Lord, he is quick and pleased to activate the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to start to transform and change you on the inside. And then why for prayer stands for again yield, but yielding in a way that says yes. Yes, Lord, I'm not just surrendering. I'm saying yes to whatever it is you're telling me. I'm saying yes to whatever it is you want. I'm saying yes to your desires, your passions, your plans, your will for my life. I'm saying yes. And then E, and I love, love, love this part, is when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and now God begins to empower you. And so I want you all to say that word with me, empower. And I love the word empower because that's exactly what the Holy Spirit as a gift to you and I is. It is empowerment. The Holy Spirit wants to do, do you or give you power. And so as you've been going to the book of James with us and you're wondering how in the world can any human being live like this? How do you do it? This is how we do it. We do not do it in our own power. We come into the presence of God through prayer and we ask him to empower us with his power to live in his righteousness righteousness in this broken and fallen world. You see, that's why the Bible tells us that we are to be in this world. We are not to be of this world. What does it mean? It means I can exist in this world and still live according to God's kingdom values and God's kingdom ways. How do I do that? When everything around me says controversial things to what my faith says, when everything around me is opposite of what the kingdom of God says, how do I do that? It's through prayer. It's through pressing into the presence of God in an intimate way. It's a, a humbling before the Lord and saying, I cannot do this without you. And it's believing by faith that his Holy Spirit will empower you and give you power to live according to his ways. Give you power to have the belief 
that he is called and created us to believe. It is to give you power to align yourself as a created one with the creator. And brothers and sisters, when that happens, that is when the reckoning takes place in your heart. And when the reckoning takes place in your heart, then you will live that faith walk out here on earth around you. And people will see that you truly are different, that you have drawn a line in the in the sand and you will not tolerate sin in your life any, anymore you will not tolerate complacency you will not tolerate apathy you will not tolerate the sinfulness of your nature you will believe by faith that god is going to transform you into the image and likeness of christ you see i heard once it said like this what you tolerate you authorize to stay and you know god wants to take every destructive behavior thought or deed in your life and remove it with the peace and the power and the passion of Christ. And so if you come to that point through prayer of the reckoning, where you truly not only know what God is telling you in the word, you're believing it and you're taking it as your code of conduct, your belief, your code by which you're gonna live by, then you'll start to see his kingdom principles and the power of the word of God take place, not only in your heart, but outside as the way you act out and live out your faith day to day. We wanted to share this clip with you because it was so timely of what's going on in the world today uh, where people have to just decide which, which side of the line are you gonna be on? I mean, you gotta draw the line and are you gonna be on God's side? Are you gonna be a part of the kingdom culture? Or are you gonna be on the world side and are you going to tolerate things of the world in your life that ultimately will cause destruction for you? And so whenever you make a stand for God, you just gotta know that there's going to be persecution and there's going to be things that will come against it. But the beautiful thing is that we know that the victory has already been won in Jesus Christ. And that if we stand and make the decision and have a reckoning on the inside of us, that we will not bend and we will stand for the righteousness of God. And we take that to the Lord in prayer. How many of us know that if God is for us, who can be against us? Because the battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle is against every principality of darkness that's out there. And God is fighting on our behalf if we will just humble ourselves and pray and turn to him and know that he will heal this land of its wicked ways. It first starts with us. But we wanted to share this amazing testimony and praise report coming from Pastor Wayne as he was interviewed on the news. So take a look at this. Protesters in Portland are now burning flags and Bibles at the federal courthouse. Local Christians are trying to remain positive, but Antifa's threats and efforts to attack anything or anyone that they do not like are now stretching beyond Portland and the federal building there. Radicals recently threatened to bring guns and gangs to pull down a 56-year-old cross from the grounds of New Hope Christian College in Eugene, Oregon. Their efforts were stopped, and the head of the college and pastor of New Hope Church, Wayne Cordero, joins us now with more. Pastor Wayne, tell us, why did Antifa threaten your college and the cross? Well, it came out about a month ago that uh, they were against uh, any race, racist monuments, and they deemed the cross as one because in 1922 to 25, the Ku Klux Klan were in the Eugene area, and they burnt a cross on a hill called Skinner's Butte. And it wasn't until 1964 that another group put up a Christian cross to be a war memorial for those that died in the war. And uh, But it was deemed a religious symbol, so it was taken down. It was awarded to our college. We put up this cross on private property at our college, but the uh, protesters see that it, it has to be some way connected with KKK, so they wanted to take it down and destroy it even though it is no longer on the property where the KKK did burn a cross. So how did your church members respond to this? Well, in mass, they showed up, and there were about 300 that showed up to say, no, we're going to draw a line in the sand against this kind of rebellion and uh, revolt, and we're not going to allow it anymore because they're eroding our Christian rights and in fact, it would be deemed a hate crime, a religious hate crime, if they came and tore that cross down, because uh, actually there's an Oregon revised statute that says that that's a bias against someone's religion. And so they stood fast and stood strong and said, it's not going to happen. Now, were these Christians left to guard the cross themselves, or did they get any help from the Eugene police? The Eugene police and the SWAT teams were very helpful. They were willing to help in any way, but they couldn't be there. They said to call them. And because Antifa had threatened to have 
long rifles and uh, open carry, we felt we better get some security there. So we had a group of about 100 people that were security for a security measure. But should they have crossed the line, we would immediately call the police and let them handle it. But uh, nothing did come of this then. What happened? <laughs> Well, some drove by uh, shouting vulgarities, others uh, made other comments, and uh, they saw the massive amount of people. And we had another maybe 150 standing around the cross worshiping for about two hours because we felt that this battle would not be ours. The battle would be the Lord's. And so according to Second Chronicles 20, we just felt that even as the Lord said to King Jehoshaphat, you send out your praisers and singers and the battle will be the Lord's. And when they sang and praised, the scripture says, the Lord set ambushes. So we decided we're going to pray. We're going to praise. We're going to pray for the pro protesters because we felt that maybe in amongst the protesters could be a Saul of Tarsus in there. And so we prayed for them. And uh, we heard a report that a busload or two of protesters were coming down from Portland and the police turned them away. So we are very grateful for the cooperation of our law enforcement. So not just the law enforcement, but the Lord turned them away. What difference did the prayer make in your opinion? Oh, I think it did everything. Ultimately, it's a spiritual battle, isn't it? It underlies everything that's going on that's crazy because the enemy is going to try his best to erode our rights. And if we volunteer, voluntarily give them up, he'll take more. And so we have to draw a line and say, enough, we're going to stand on the promises of God's word. We're going to take this to prayer and praise, and we're going to let the Lord take on this battle and begin to make a difference. And Pastor Wayne, I imagine uh, it isn't over yet. I imagine you're still on guard. Uh, this might not be the end of it. That's right. There's going to be a group of vigilant uh, people watching, a safety and security team, so we have cameras and uh, we have different uh, fences that have been built so that they know that they're trespassing. So we're going to stay vigilant and uh, watch for what they may do because they'll sometimes strike without us expecting it. Okay, Christians and their churches now under attack right here in the United States of America. Pastor Wayne Cordero, thank you for joining us from Eugene, Oregon. What a powerful testimony of Christian believers standing and making a stand and believing by faith that nothing is impossible for our God. And so if you're here this morning and maybe this entire series has been a challenge for you. I know that it's been a challenging even for those of us that have been walking with the Lord for some time. And maybe for you, uh, the first thing you want to do is just get your life right. Maybe you just really truly need to make a heart decision to follow the Lord. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ and said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow in your ways. And, and if you're watching today and maybe you are a follower of Jesus, but you've not had that moment where you've had the reckoning, where you've had that encounter with God that is so mighty and so strong that it will change the rest of your life. I think of uh, a Saul who became a Paul. Uh, you know, the greatest persecutor of all Christians had his reckoning moment where he met and encountered Jesus Christ face to face and it forever transformed how he would live out his life here on earth. And so maybe that's you. You, you kind of know about Jesus, but you never had that moment of reckoning on the inside of you. If, if that's you, I want to pray for you as well this morning. And, you know, maybe you need to rededicate your life and you you followed Jesus for some time and you, you, like many people, got discouraged because you kept falling. Your faith was broken under pressure. Well, the good news is you can always come back to God. There's always forgiveness. There's always mercy. There's always grace because our God is a good, good God. So no matter who you are this morning, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. You can click a, a link there in the chat room. Um, or if you're just watching a, on TV or you're watching this on YouTube, I want to invite you just to bow your head and say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that he would so willingly and obediently die a sinner's death for me. And I ask you now to forgive me of my sins. Father, I want to live my life according to your ways. Continue to teach me how to live with faith and righteousness so that I will not have a breaking point, but instead I will patiently endure 
through every circumstances until the day that my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, returns. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen and amen and amen. Well, if you said that prayer this morning, I want to just congratulate you and welcome you into the family of God. We're so excited for you. And I just want you to know that your best is yet to come. You are now on an amazing journey of faith and love and joy and excitement. And yes, some trials and yes, some temptations. But just know that through prayer, you can be empowered to overcome and endure whatever it is this world may throw at, at you. And why is that important? Because God wants to use each and every one of you to lead somebody else to Christ. Did you know that at the conclusion of chapter 5, James says in verse 19, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. That is what your prayer life can avail. Remember, the prayers of a righteous person, person avails much. And so what is at stake here? Why is this so important? There are people around you every day that don't know the truth about who Jesus Christ is, or people who knew who Jesus was and faced a breaking point and fell away. But through your prayer life, through your love and your obedience, God can use you to bring somebody back into the faith. And just like Pastor Wayne said, they were praying for somebody that is trying to persecute their school that could possibly be Saul of Tarsus, that God is wanting to transform to Paul the Apostle, who would radically transform many, many cities for the glory of God. And so that's what it's all about, church. Each and every one of us pressing in, not allowing for the things of this world to break our faith, but standing strong with the line drawn in the sand, experiencing that reckoning and that boldness and conviction that says, I will live for the glory of God. It's been a great joy and pleasure being with you. Until we see you next week, aloha and God bless. Wow, what a great message, culmination to our Breaking Point series, Pastor Teresa. And yes, one day we'll all have to face our reckoning, but until then, let's walk closely with Jesus. And, uh, and church, you know, if you need... Uh, the connection with other Christians to remain strong and uh, encouraged throughout the week. Let us know because there are so many groups that are meeting virtually, all staying safe and wise in this uh, uncertain times. But we are certain that we have a wonderful God who will love us and protect us and provide for us. And until next week, bye, aloha, mask up well. New Hope Spark, the online ministries of New Hope Central Oahu.